Welcome back, everyone. It is the final part of this six-part reaction series to the two episodes of the Congress of Vienna by Historia Civilis. I am so glad in reading all the comments to see you guys are enjoying this as much as I am. I have learned a bunch. I hope you have too. Uh, so we're going to continue and cover the last 20 minutes or so of this today. As always, if you're new to the series, there are links in the description that will take you back to the beginning of both episodes of my reaction as well as the original content. I could not recommend this channel, Historia Civilis, to you enough. Fantastic stuff, well-researched, well-documented sources. Uh, they really have done their homework and presented it in a way that I think helps us learn a lot. So let's go ahead and pick up the story right where we left off. There were other areas that could not be fully restored under the 1792 borders. Italy had been totally reshaped under French rule, and the Congress of Vienna needed to decide how much French influence was acceptable in the region. So it's important to note that while we talk about the idea of Italy, Italy as we know it today as one nation that controls all of this territory from up here down through there and including Sicily, Italy doesn't exist as a nation as we know it, unified in all those parts. It's still multiple states that are constantly changing and in flux and dominated by different groups over the years. Uh, we're still uh, several decades before the unification of Italy at this point. Going forward, at the moment of his defeat, Napoleon had been king of Italy, really northern Italy, and his son had been king of Rome, also northern Italy, and one of his top generals had been the king of Naples, southern Italy. Obviously this arrangement couldn't continue, but it was not immediately clear what the Congress should do. Metternich and the Austrian Emperor took a particular interest in this. They considered Northern Italy Austria's backyard, and Metternich believed that if Austria and France were in constant competition for influence in Northern Italy, it would eventually end in another war. And you know that's not entirely off base, because one of the main reasons why in World War I, a hundred years later, that Italy, who had been allied with the Central Powers, Austria and Germany, why they end up joining the Entente, the Allies, uh, in fighting for them is is because of a, a disagreement over some territory that Austria-Hungary is in control of that Italy wants back uh, or wants to have control over. Uh, and that becomes one of those sticking points. So it's interesting to see kind of some of the seeds of that here. Whatever the new political settlement in northern Italy looked like, it had to be able to resist French influence going forward. Metternich spoke to Castlereagh about this, and the two found that they were of the same mind. Castlereagh told him that Britain was not overly concerned about the future of northern Italy, so long as it remained out of reach for the French. The two men came to an agreement. Remembering the Poland-Saxony crisis, Castlereagh said that the British public was in an anti-imperialist mood right now, <laughs> and so he couldn't appear to support any sweeping annexations of territory. However, let's just take a minute and pause and consider the British public being anti-imperialist. Britain had no problem with Austrian hegemony in the region. If Metternich could draw up a plan that only made minor territorial adjustments, wink wink, he could count on Castlereagh's support. I should be clear that I'm not singling out the British here. Every country is anti other people being imperialists and pro themselves being imperialists to a point. Once it became clear to all parties that the future of Italy was being discussed, there were calls to replicate the success of the German committee by forming an Italian committee. Metternich and Castlereagh shut this talk down immediately. Per their agreement, the future of Italy would be decided by Metternich alone. Hmm. Interesting. This is what he came up with. Austria would conduct a minor territorial adjustment by directly annexing Lombardy and Venice. Adjustment. This would add millions of Italians to the Austrian Empire. Metternich knew that the Hungarians would have opposed any deal that added more ethnic Germans to the Empire, since it would have upset the delicate balance within Austria. 
Expand. So we've got to find some other way to grow the empire without adding Germans. So we've got some Slavs, there's some Italians, you know, there's other groups of people we can absorb. Ending into northern Italy was seen as politically neutral, so Metternich used this opportunity to beef up Austria by annexing one of the richest parts of Europe. Castlereagh noticed this, but deemed it minor enough to escape the notice of the British public. Next, Metternich recreated the Duchy of Parma and handed it over to Mary Louise of Austria, the Austrian Emperor's eldest daughter. The fact that she remained the wife of Napoleon was a bit say. inconvenient, so Metternich carved out a rule so that the duchy would go to some nephew of the Spanish king upon her death. So that way it, it keeps it from being in Napoleon's family. But yeah, I mean, this is the, the woman who was Napoleon's second wife. And remember, Napoleon's still alive at this time, and he's kind of chilling down here, not far from his home of Corsica. Spain had been upset when Metternich got the authority to reshape northern Italy, and this was Metternich's way of throwing them a bone. The Grand Duchy of Tuscany was also recreated and handed over to the brother of the Austrian Emperor. Similarly, the Duchy... Are you noticing a pattern here? You left everything up to Metternich, who's from Austria, and so you're basically saying, we don't want France to have influence, but we're going to give all this influence to the Austrians. So the Austrian uh, Kaiser's daughter is going to control one area. Uh, you know, the, they're just going to have complete dominance here. ...of Modena was recreated and handed to some cousin of the Austrian emperor. Noticing a pattern yet? By doing this, Metternich that. technically met Castlereagh's requirement to not openly annex all of northern Italy. But it it's it's similar to what happened with the Russians, right? Where uh, the Russian Tsar is made king of Poland. So it's not really Russian, but it's really Russian. It was a bit deceptive. In some cases, the prime ministers of these new states would be Austrian officials hand-picked by Metternich. They're puppets. On paper, puppets. these were all independent countries. But in reality, the Austrians were treating northern Italy like a colony. In addition to all this, Metternich reformed the Papal States, which was an important sticking point to the majority Catholic Austrian Empire. He also strengthened and restored the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. As an independent and fairly strong regional power, they would serve as a buffer against any future French expansion. Finally, Napoleon's former general was eventually removed from southern Italy, and a distant relation of the King of Spain returned to rule the region once more. I should briefly talk about how Napoleon's general was removed from southern Italy. It involves an event known to history as the Hundred Days. Here's a brief summary of what happened. When the Congress of Vienna was like six months into negotiations, Napoleon secretly slipped away from his confinement on the island of Elba and landed in southern France. He marched north with maybe a thousand supporters, but as he advanced, thousands more flocked to his banner. And this is what Napoleon was counting on. I mean, this could have been nipped in the bud real quick. You might not have ever had to have a Battle of Waterloo if the very earliest supporters hadn't flocked back to Napoleon, because it's not like he landed in France with a huge army. He gathered that army as he moved north. He even turned an army that was sent to take him down. Three weeks after landing in France, he captured Paris without firing a shot. The Allies had long feared something like this, and in fact, during the last six months of negotiations, the great powers had kept their armies mobilized. Which is really key here, because if you ever wonder why Napoleon, from the time he lands in southern France and gathers an army to the time he's defeated in the early summer of 1815 at Waterloo, it was pretty quick. Uh, it, you know, so in order for the, the Allies to have been able to mobilize these armies that take him down, they had to be there already or close by. And so it's pretty impressive stuff that they were able to gather enough forces to come take Napoleon down so quickly. For this very reason. Within hours of Napoleon's disappearance from Elba, hundreds of thousands of soldiers were marching on France. 
They weren't messing Three around. Three months after Napoleon captured Paris, British and Prussian armies faced the French outside the town of Waterloo in the Netherlands, current day Belgium. I was going to say, it's just south of Brussels, Belgium, if you're looking on a map. It's just south of Brussels. At Waterloo, Napoleon was soundly defeated by the British general Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon fled, and about a month later, he surrendered to the British, who promptly sent him to the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where... This time, without all the trappings of still being an emperor, he was very much a prisoner this time. They weren't messing around. ...under the watchful eye of the British, he would spend the rest of his days. Which wasn't very long. He I've been strategically young. talking around the 100 days for this entire video. Because while it's certainly militarily interesting, and Napoleonically interesting, it's not diplomatically interesting. Yeah. From the perspective of the Congress of Vienna, the Hundred Days were a brief pause in negotiations. After I, I think that at this point, and I've said this in other videos talking about battles, we, I think sometimes we overstate the importance of the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, the real defeat of Napoleon happens in, in 1814 when he abdicates and it leads to all of this. Waterloo, if Napoleon had won the Battle of Waterloo, it would not have changed anything. There would have been another battle and another. He could have lost six Waterloos or, or won six Waterloos and it wouldn't have changed the outcome. There were The whole of Europe had gathered armies against him. There was no outcome of that that leaves Napoleon on the throne. It just wasn't gonna happen. After which, everyone just picked back up where they left off. Also, and this may annoy some people, but it must be said, the Hundred Days were not a particularly close call. No. When Napoleon nope. captured Paris, he had maybe 50,000 soldiers at his disposal. The Allies had a million. Naturally, yep. Napoleon immediately began raising 100,000 additional soldiers. But so did the Allies, and by this point, the Allies were faster. If Napoleon had won at Waterloo, there would have been another Waterloo later that summer. If there he had go. won 10 Take Waterloos, shot. the Allies still would have had him outnumbered. The entire 100 days was an act of delusion, yep. and there was never a serious threat of a French victory. 100% accurate. Anyways, I bring all that up because Napoleon's former general, the King of Naples, sided with Napoleon during the crisis, which Oops. gave Metternich a good excuse to remove him from power yep. and have him executed. So this will be interesting to see how this gets covered because by the time we have this happening, the British Empire has outlawed the slave trade under the incredible influence of uh, William Wilberforce, who was kind of the guy who single-handedly, in a lot of ways, carried that forward. And we're about, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so away from the British Empire actually outlawing slavery itself. So here was the framework for the final settlement. Broadly speaking, Europe would return to its 1792 borders. Russia would swallow up Poland under a strict constitutional arrangement, and Prussia would annex half of Saxony. The Holy Roman Empire would be replaced with the much more practical German Confederation. Northern Italy would become an anti-French zone under Austrian supervision. With negotiations drawing to a close, there was one lingering issue that had not yet been addressed. The British Prime Minister Liverpool instructed Castlereagh to begin discussing slavery. By 1815, the British anti-slavery political movement had truly become a force to be reckoned with. In 1788, a bunch of local abolitionist groups sent Parliament 60,000 signatures calling for the abolition of slavery. In 1815, these same groups gathered almost a million signatures, but this time they didn't send them to Parliament. They sent them to Castlereagh in Vienna. One statistic that was not lost on anybody was that the number of signatures sent to Castlereagh was greater than the total number of votes in the last election. This was not simply an act of protest. It was a shot across the bow. By this time, every British city and most British towns had an abolitionist group that was active in local politics. 
It was not uncommon for the average British voter to hear about the ongoing sin of slavery on a weekly basis. And it's kind of interesting because before the British had even outlawed the slave trade, uh, by and large, slavery doesn't really exist in the British Isles, um, at least not African slavery. I mean, you can argue that, uh, in effect, there was enslavement going on, but um, the, the way we understand slavery didn't exist. And um, But yeah, there's a massive shift in uh, public perception when it comes to the idea of slavery between the end of the American Civil War and by the time you get to the Napoleonic Wars. And again, Wilberforce is a big part of that movement that really, like, he, he kind of single-handedly drags Parliament into outlawing the slave trade. Uh, if you want to see kind of a, a fascinating kind of Hollywood look at it, there's a movie called Amazing Grace um, that kind of shows Wilberforce's story a little bit. And he was influenced very heavily by... Uh, one of his mentors was John Newton, who uh, I'm getting way sidetracked, but it's a it's an interesting story worth telling. John Newton had been the captain of a slave ship, uh, transporting Africans to you know as part of that kind of triangle trade, uh, and had become a Christian and actually had gone into ministry. And at some point, he wrote his story in the form of a poem called "Faith's Review and Expectation." And it was kind of telling his story about what a terrible person he had been and how he had changed so much. Faith's Review and Expectation got written in, as a song. The words that John Newton wrote were, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He wrote Amazing Grace, telling his story of having been a slave ship captain. And so he was a huge influence on Wilberforce. And Wilberforce kind of brings this this bill to outlaw the slave trade over and over and over again to Parliament. And every time gets a few more votes. Finally gets William Pitt the Younger, who's like prime minister in his 20s, on board with it. William Pitt in that movie is played by Benedict Cumberbatch, one of his very first roles. So definitely worth checking out in their church and in their newspaper. The issue became impossible to avoid. After one particularly incendiary pamphlet went viral, more than 300,000 women pledged to boycott sugar since it was exclusively produced with slave labor. Yep. People were hungry for action, and when the government showed no interest in doing anything, they grabbed at whatever consumer choices might make a difference. Political activism against slavery was so popular in some circles that it became fashionable, literally. This medallion, hmm. called the Wedgwood Medallion, was mass-produced in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Men generally wore them around their necks, and women wow. around their wrists or pinned into their hmm. hair. The inscription reads, Am I not a man and a brother? This image of a man kneeling in chains became the most widely distributed piece of art depicting a black man ever. And the wow, I mean, just, you know, and there's a lot of significance to this because you are affirming the humanity of slaves. These are not property. These are not things to be owned. They are people. They are human every bit as much as you are human. The unofficial logo of the anti-slavery movement in 1807, at the end of a political fight that lasted more than 15 years, Britain passed an act that abolished the British slave trade. It did not abolish the act of right. slavery, but it 30s. made it illegal to transport enslaved persons across the Atlantic to the colonies. Advocates believed that without new bodies coming over from Africa, chattel slavery in the colonies would mostly die out within one or two generations. Now, of course, you can see the problem with that, which is, of course, that if there are no new slaves being brought to places like America, then the existing slaves become that much more valuable because now they are a commodity that can't be produced except from existing slaves. Uh, now, I will say this, that the abolition of the slave trade, and soon after this, um, well, right about this time, not uh, I, I, the U.S. Constitution had a provision in it that 20 years after the adoption of the Constitution was the earliest that the United States could outlaw the slave trade. It was written into the Constitution, and they did that right around that time. So this is pretty close. Constitution 1789... 
Um, so you're talking right around the same time that the U.S. ends up abolishing the slave trade as well. And this, in the aftermath of the War of 1812, and the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, will, will be one of the first areas where you see the U.S. and the British actually working together because their navies kind of work in coordination to patrol the west coast of Africa uh, to stop slave trading ships. Now, they don't always do a very effective job of that, but they do start kind of working together to achieve that goal. They were wrong, but it was nevertheless a big deal that Britain finally acknowledged that their goal was to eventually abolish slavery. The abolitionists were correctly not satisfied by this half measure. They demanded nothing less than the complete and total abolition of slavery. And as the years went on, their influence only continued to grow. Yeah, another 25 years before that Lord happens. Liverpool inherited this political situation when he became Prime Minister. And he wasn't happy about it. He was holding on to his conservative Whig majority in Parliament by the barest of threats. And now the abolitionists had sent a million signatures to his foreign secretary in Vienna. Liverpool didn't really care one way or the other about slavery. But if he didn't give these people something, they might topple his government. He instructed Castlereagh to try to get some anti-slavery commitments into try the final agreement stuff in there. at Vienna. <laughs> Castlereagh approached the eight-member Central Committee that is, the five great powers, plus Spain, Portugal, and Sweden, and ask them to include a provision in the final agreement that committed everybody to the eventual abolition mm. of the slave trade. Good luck. Of those present, only Britain and Sweden had abolished the slave trade. Castlereagh's opening position was that everybody else should adopt Britain's anti-slavery laws. Another way of saying that is that Castlereagh was not committing Britain to any further anti-slavery reforms. This fact was not lost on Castlereagh's negotiating partners. Spain, Portugal, and France threw a fit. France is an interesting case, because they had heroically abolished slavery at the beginning of their revolution. Yep. And then, under Napoleon, they shamefully brought it back. Spain and Portugal were the other two powers most heavily enmeshed with the slave trade. Spain, Portugal, and France argued that Britain only wanted to abolish the slave trade because they had a head start out in the colonies. They also argued that an agreement like this would give the British Navy an excuse to stop and inspect every ship in the Atlantic. In other words, this would all be to Britain's advantage. Castlereagh tried to respond by appealing to morality, but this only incensed them even further. One Spanish diplomat got in Castlereagh's face and told him, The English have always been good at making business march alongside honor. Joke's on him. That's not a... I mean, but is that unique to the British? I mean, every one of these nations is thinking of their own self-interest in all of this. Uh, I don't think that's unique to the British. Him, Castlereagh was Irish. I'm Irish. Irish. Random appearance of Joe Biden. If we think about this for a moment, Castlereagh could have shown Britain's commitment to the cause by talking about complete and total abolition which would have hurt Britain more than anyone. Yeah, they weren't ready if for that. If he had walked into the room talking about abolition, he would have had some credibility because he would have been saying, let's all do something difficult together. Yeah. But Castlereagh didn't bring up total abolition because he was an imperialist and he wasn't that personally bothered by slavery. After some agonizing negotiations, they agreed to attach a document to the final treaty coming out of Vienna called a Declaration of Intent to Abolish the Slave Trade. So we'll all agree that it should happen, but we're not agreeing to make it happen is basically what this is. At Spain and Portugal's insistence, this declaration would be non-binding, which sucks. Yeah. Castlereagh was like, if it's non-binding, we're going to need to show people some specific goals, at least. France agreed to abolish the slave trade within five years. They would blow right past that deadline. 
Spain agreed to abolish the slave trade within eight years, with some pretty large loopholes. They would blow right past that deadline. Portugal would only agree to abolish the slave trade north of the equator. And since they didn't really have any colonies north of the equator, this was pretty much a giant middle finger to the rest of the Congress. Castlereagh also got all of the participants to declare their intention to eradicate slavery once and for all, hmm. but they provided absolutely no specifics and no deadlines. So if you can't even get people to make a commitment to abolish the, the trade, and we know in hindsight, of course, that they didn't, uh, why in the world would they abolish slavery itself? A meaningless statement Completely meant meaningless. to simply soothe public opinion. In the end, Britain's attempt to inject anti-slavery commitments into the Congress was a failure. Yeah. The reason it was a failure is that Castlereagh didn't even really try. He was half-hearted from the start, and his service. reluctance to come in there with any radical proposals was a signal to the other great powers that Britain wasn't really taking this seriously. It's a shame, because this was a moment when something big could have been accomplished. Britain had serious leverage and serious public support, and Castlereagh didn't use any of it. Now, I will say, I mean, they're dealing with a lot of pretty big issues in all of this, and if his heart wasn't in this issue, he's going to spend his political points that he has with everybody else on stuff that really does matter to him. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of this, but if this was really about just placating public opinion back home, but his heart wasn't in it, he's not going to waste what leverage he has on an issue that he doesn't see as that big a deal. One of the consequences of Castlereagh's lack of enthusiasm in 1815 was that slavery continued in places like Cuba and Brazil until the late mm. 1880s. That's a lot of lives and a lot of years, and it's a real stain on Castlereagh's record that he didn't really try to do anything about it. But from a purely political standpoint, the anti-slavery negotiations worked. Prime Minister Liverpool now had something to show the discontents back home. And for now, that was enough. The Treaty of Vienna was finalized in June of 1815. Right about the time of Waterloo. All of the great powers signed off on it. The only outlier was Spain, who remained upset over Metternich's heavy-handed treatment of Northern Italy. Spain refused to sign the final document, which was unfortunate, but so long as all the great powers were on board, this was deemed acceptable. The final treaty was mostly built upon realist principles and created a balance of power with clearly defined spheres of influence that would, hopefully, prevent future great power conflicts. Hopefully. After Vienna, it was widely understood and accepted that if anybody invaded one of those tiny German states, it would automatically mean war with Prussia and Austria. If anybody invaded Northern Italy, it would automatically mean war with Austria. If anybody invaded the Netherlands, it would automatically mean war with Britain. If anybody invaded Poland, it would automatically mean war with Russia. The belief was that so long as governments understood what was and wasn't off-limits, minor disagreements could be solved hmm. diplomatically, and great power conflicts on the scale of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars could be entirely avoided. It was in the interest of all great powers to respect these limitations, and if any great power was found to be acting recklessly or belligerently, it was in the interest of everybody else to put them in their place. After 25 years of chaos and war, the great powers were having a go at stability. This international system that emerged from Vienna is sometimes called the Concert of Europe, as in all of Europe acting in concert yep. or in unison. The next 15 years would put a severe test upon the concert system, and we will see in time whether these frenzied and far-reaching negotiations were worth it. So testing it, you know, if you think about this just from a purely human standpoint, as soon as you put rules in place, what do people start doing? Testing the limits of those rules. How far can I push? 
how far can I go before I get stepped on, right? So if we understand that we've set these boundaries, now I'm going to try and push things to the limit. What can I get away with without anybody kind of stepping in? And that's what, you know, for example, is happening in the 1930s in Europe, where you have the Anschluss and you have the Sudetenland and, and you have Germany kind of saying, how far can we go before the entire country or in the entire continent of Europe turns on us and says no more? Uh, and, you know, that's what children do with their parents. How far can I push the rules? You know, so, yeah, it works a little for a little while. We do have some major wars. I mean, you've got all the revolutions that happened in the 1840s. You're going to have uh, really things kick up in the 1850s. You've got the Crimean War that the U.K. and Russia and others get involved in. Then in the 1860s is when you're going to have a bunch of conflict happening in Central Europe. Uh, and then all of this is building up to World War I. Is that it? I guess so. Awesome. Fantastic stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I have. I think you have from reading all the comments. So thank you for those comments. Keep them coming. And we'll be diving into probably going back to extra history and checking out some of their latest stuff tomorrow. So we'll see. I might be in the mood for something completely different. Might even do a stream. We'll see. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you again soon.